So, we are talking about directivity now. Um, there is some homework for this section, but I can't give it to you until Friday because you won't know what to do with it. Um, but then you have to do it over the weekend. So, because um, I have to teach you for two days before you'll, you could even start that homework. So, uh, so just get ready. You're going to have a good little project this weekend to tackle. All right. Um, so let's talk about, I'm telling you now, so you don't freak out when I dump this thing on you on Friday. You're like, what the crap? I was supposed to do this whole thing in just the weekend. It's like, and it's like, yeah. That's exactly what you're going to have to do. So get ready. Yes, I will complain, but then I will have all that. All right. So what's the deal with directivity? Well, the, the first thing to understand is that, and I've mentioned this before, is that sound naturally wants to go everywhere uh, within some, some caveats. But generally speaking, sound goes everywhere. It only stops going everywhere when you do something to impede it or confine it in some way. Okay. And when you confine it, it tends to get louder in the area where it is still allowed to travel. And by confining, I mean like you put something in the way to keep it from going a certain direction. Okay? Uh, and when that happens, it gets louder in the area that you're still allowing it to travel for reasons that we'll discuss. But there are a couple of concepts that uh, that we use to dis or terms that we use to describe what happens when you confine it. So one is called directivity index, the other is called directivity factor. So directivity index is basically just how much louder does it get because you confined it. Uh, 3 dB louder, 6 dB louder. Now keeping in mind this is 3 dB, 6 dB, in the direction that the sound is still b being allowed to go. Okay? Um, directivity factor is, is uh, the ratio between the level of the sound that was not confined and the level that you get after it was confined. Okay? So the difference between those two things. So for example, if you had a directivity factor of 2, that would mean you would probably have a directivity index of three. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was, Wait, yes, because you double it, you gain three dB. Exactly. Uh, uh, I want yes. that. I'm going home. Big three. <laughs> Whereas if you had a directivity factor of four, uh, well, six. a directivity index of six. Six. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. You're getting the idea. Oh, yeah, every time you double. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how, how do you confine sound? Well, I've given you some examples here. So uh, walls confine sound. Um, you know, if we do sound outside uh, in what's called a free field environment, it just goes everywhere. But you bring it inside and there's walls, then the walls you know, will confine the sound and how it's able to propagate. Uh, but we also use things like horns that you've, you know, you've seen you know, horns that we would put on a compression driver. That the, what that's trying to do is confine the sound. It's trying to keep it from going everywhere and trying to get it to go mostly in one place. Okay? Uh, we put loudspeaker drivers inside of boxes for the purpose of confining them because they, it gets louder when you put it in the box. Okay? Uh, and if you think about it, you know, there's this concept called an infinite baffle that, that you might, might want to be familiar with. So if I, if I were to like cut a hole in this wall right here and stick a loudspeaker driver in the wall, and if this wall went on forever, you know, like it was a forever, t forever tall wall, wow. then, then this would be an infinite baffle, which means I would be completely confining the sound from going behind the wall, right? The wall would be stopping it, okay? Um, now, uh, when you put it in a box, like these ones that are on the wall, that is an infinite baffle. 
right? Obviously, we can't make a wall that goes on forever, but but we can make a box that behaves that way, right? So uh, the idea is that any sound that is would normally go off the back of the driver can't go that way anymore, <laughs> right? Because you've stopped it. You, you've 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 put it in an infinite baffle. So a a cabinet is like a wall that goes on forever. That's why we use it. Because we get all that energy that used to go to the back. Now it doesn't get to go there. It has to go somewhere. Where's it going to go? We just put it in a Mobius it's going to go the opposite direction, right? Yeah. So that's why you get a doubling. It's not a perfect doubling uh, of sound pressure because of interactions that we've learned about. So if it was perfect, you'd get 6 dB, right? But it's not perfect, so you get 3. Because of? Why do you, why would you only get three? What? What is what? Why do you only get three instead of six when you would double it like that? Because it closed on both ends. Are we talking about this? Cone filtering. <laughs> One of the two answers to most questions I ask you: cone filtering or it depends, right? So. Uh, Let's take a look at what we're we get, give you another uh, look at what we're talking about. So imagine that we have a thing that makes sound, and that's what is represented by this little symbol on the left. And the little lines coming out of it are sound going everywhere. Okay. <laughs> so sounds going everywhere with the lines, right? And then over here, we uh, let's at some given distance that we're defining as L, uh, we measure the sound pressure level at that distance from you know, after that thing that makes whatever amount of sound it makes, you measure it at a certain distance away. Great, it is that loud, however loud that is. And we can call that zero for directivity index. Why is it only a zero for directivity index? Why? Oh, because, we, because we haven't confined it. Remember, directivity index is a measurement of how much louder it got as a result of confining the sound. We have not confined the sound. And therefore, we have a directivity index of zero. So it is however loud it is without being confined. And the directivity factor is 1 because it's a 1 to 1 ratio. Yes. We have not confined it. Uh, directivity factor is also called Q sometimes. So a Q of 1. We sometimes use like a horn. We describe a horn based on its Q. Okay, And its Q is, is really a connected to directivity factor. So in this scenario, no confining. We have, the, it just, the thing makes whatever amount of sound it makes. This is the universe we have been operating in thus far this semester, okay? All of the math we've been doing and all the assumptions we've been making have been this scenario, okay? But we, of course, know that we don't ever do sound in a free, completely free field environment. There are obstacles that get in the way of our sound. So what happens when you start introducing these obstacles? Well, let's just introduce walls, okay? So what if we take this thing that makes this sound, that goes everywhere equally in all directions, what happens if we just put it up against a wall, OK? So here's a little cross section of a wall, uh, a baffle, if you will. Um, well, all this energy that used to be going this direction over to the left, right, used to go there, can't go there anymore because there's a wall. Uh, and that energy doesn't just disappear because it runs into a wall. Right? What if it's something that's for absorption? We haven't learned that that kind of thing exists yet. So, uh, so generally, that, that energy has to go somewhere, right? Energy, what's that, what's that law of physics? Energy cannot be created or destroyed or something. So it's like it's not going like, to disappear just because it hits a wall, OK? Now, yeah, we know that, and we'll learn later, that it is possible for that energy to get sucked up by the wall if you do it the right way. But let's assume we can't do that yet. So the only other option, then, is, is it has to go the other way, right? That energy is trying to go this way. It can't go this way, so it's going to go the other way, OK, because the wall is stopping it. And if it goes the other way, now you've kind of doubled the amount of energy you're sending over here to where you're measuring. So now you have energy times 2. Right? But it doesn't, it's not fully blocking half of that point source, is it? Because you have all this stuff going 
We're pretending this is forever. Uh, so in this case, we would have now a 3 dB increase at our measurement position. We haven't moved the mic. We haven't moved the thing that makes the sound. We just put a wall next to it. That's all we did. And suddenly, we measured 3 dB more sound, okay? which would be a directivity factor of, Q of 2, or a Q of 2, we would call it, okay? uh, because we had a 2 to 1 ratio. We doubled it. Make sense so far? Um, so what about, what if we add another wall? Like what if we now think about the floor? We put it down in this corner. Okay, so now you got sound that used to go over, you know, there's sound that used to go this way that can't go that way anymore. And there's sound that used to go this way that can't go that way anymore. So where's it going to go? Well, both bits of this sound, now measuring at the same distance, are going to go towards where we're measuring. So we've actually folded that sound on top of itself twice now. So now we have sound times four. You add another wall, it's going to be times six. Ah, yes. So we now have a six dB increase. So now it's six dB louder than it used to be. Okay. So that's a directivity index of six dB, or a directivity factor of four, Q four. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. You with me? Yeah, so what if I add another wall? So now we're folding the sound on top of itself three times. And so now in the direction where it is allowed to propagate, we have a 9 dB increase, which would be a directivity index of 9, 9 dB, or a directivity factor of 8, a Q of 8, because it's an 8 to 1 ratio now. You understand why it's 8? Yep, two to four to eight. We've doubled it three times. Will okay. You, will you ever end up with anything that's not? No, you can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you would need a bit something, a scenario, a bit more complicated than the one I'm showing you right now in order to get that kind of number. But, uh, but sure. Now. Uh, Here's a couple of things that I want you to think about is remember in the context of sound systems and assuming that our primary goal is sound reinforcement, generally what we're trying to do is make stuff louder, right? That is what our job is, to make stuff louder. Uh, and so the reason that we put loudspeaker drivers inside of boxes is because it makes them louder. Really? Whoa. Like just that simple act of putting it in a box makes it louder. Okay. Um, None of you guys are reacting properly to what he's saying. I'm carrying the team here. I appreciate that. Uh, however, the box doesn't, you know, there's sometimes little holes in the box, it's maybe not a perfect baffle or whatever, you can get even more sound because uh, you may be able to use the room to your advantage. The reason that you only get 3 dB per wall was what? Because you're only reflecting that half. Comb filtering, no. right? That's the reason you only get 3 dB per wall <laughs> as opposed to 6 dB because of comb filtering. Why? Why is it comb filtering? Well, you know, well, why? Why is it comb filtering? Any ideas? Yeah, so, so maybe there's a little bit of distance between. But if you put the wall a phase distance away, then what happens? Well, it just comb filters different frequencies now. Because um, remember, comb filtering is. What if you have a bunch of walls at different distances? Well, then you'd have a diffusion panel. Um, but. In what the point I'm trying to make here is that what what frequency what's the first frequency that would start to cancel out? Your yes, and we figure that out based on what? The distance. Yeah, so what like if this thing is right up against the wall, it's really close to the wall, you know, yeah, like a, like five four or five inches, the like frequency. what frequency is going to cancel out first, right? Yeah, the higher ones, right? So what's, what about the lower ones? They kind of just keep going. 
Yeah, they haven't, they haven't uh, traveled far enough to get to you to half a cycle difference, right? And you have to get to a half cycle difference before you get a cancellation. So they're still through? No. You act for low frequencies, you get 6 dB increase. Because no cone filter. Exactly. God, that's so smart. Um, so <laughs> this is why I almost always try to put my subwoofers against a wall. <laughs> because yeah. for every wall I can get them against, I get 6 dB more sound out of them for free. <laughs> right? Yeah, but think about like, so if I just put it down in the corner against the wall on the floor, I get 12 dB more sound out of that sub for free. Now, uh, how much, you know, if I, if I was going to try to get 12 dB more sound out of that sub by buying a bigger amplifier, That's a lot of it. A lot right? So if I started with, it's a 500 watt amplifier driving that sub, how many watts would I have to oh. do to get a, another 12 dB? Wait, okay. Well, 3 more dB would be 1,000 watts, right? We're turning 12, it'd be like 6 dB would be 2,000 watts. Yeah. 9 dB would be 4,000 watts. 12 dB would be 8,000 watts. It's insane. That's not very practical, but I could just put it up in the corner, and I could get that same 12 dB out of it, okay, as a result of confining it. Now, of course, sometimes to put it up against the wall, you have to change the distance that it is away from the listener. Uh, so you might lose some of that 12 dB by doing that. Yes? Does it genuinely change how effective, like, obviously putting it up against a concrete wall is going to be different than putting it up against, like, a sheet of two by, right? So, like, if you build a little baffle, that's not... Sure, material matters. Material matters for sure, um, but in this context, you know, not as like much. If I take a subwoofer, I put it in that corner, uh -huh. or I take a subwoofer and I put it next to that sheet of plywood. Mm -hmm. Is it still going to be 12 dB? Yeah, probably. It would have to be really thin in order for it to not be the 12 dB. Wow, okay. Okay. Um, so that's just a little tip, right? A little, little take home tip. Uh, all right. So. The, this is just the basic, basic concept behind what hap why we want to make our loudspeakers directional. Generally speaking, sound wants to go everywhere. Okay? Uh, and we tend to try to get it to not go everywhere, which creates some new problems for us that we, we will discover on Friday. Um, but it's worth it because trying to get it to not go everywhere makes it louder, okay? And making it louder is the name of the game. That's the whole reason why we get to do this, <laughs> is to make stuff louder, okay? Now, uh, the, what happens when you confine it, as we've seen, the difference in level that you get by confining it is dependent on frequency, right? That was the whole conversation we just had about subwoofers and everything is that some frequencies get louder than others as a result of confining. So now let's, so let's imagine that this thing, whatever it is, that was making all this sound that was going ev everywhere, you know, in all directions, and let's assume that all the frequencies were the same level. Guess what? I put it in this corner now. It's not, it's not they're not all the same level anymore. Yeah, overall we got louder. But the frequency response is dramatically different now, okay? So then Which is kind of a bummer because we tend to like all the frequencies to be kind of the same level, right? Obviously, we've done stuff to uh, combat that, but then wouldn't just a driver outside of a box be the most accurate reproduction of sound? Is that what you're saying then? If the frequency response would stay consistent then? Not necessarily, because the driver itself has has, has its own kind of confining properties, as we'll discuss here in a little bit. So a loudspeaker, a circular loudspeaker driver is not perfectly omnidirectional. Okay. Um, but, you know, sound, sounds of nature and things, they tend to be omnidirectional, right? Uh, so it's... So we're putting birds in boxes. Yeah, okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk more about, in a minute, about kind of that 
some of the theory behind what this means for loudspeakers itself. Uh, but the, 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 the notion, the idea that I want you to wrap your head around right now is that there's a lot of really good reasons why we would c try to make a sound be more directional. Okay? There's a lot of really good reasons why we do that. Uh, but that comes with some baggage. Okay? And understanding that baggage uh, is the name of the game. If you can, if you, if you try to under, if you, if you don't pay attention to that and figure out how to deal with that baggage that came from confining the sound, then you're going to have a really, really awful sounding system. Okay. So there's been a lot of efforts to try to figure out how could we capture that complicated piece of data that results from confining the sound. We know that it changes some things, but how do we how could how do we capture the changes that happen in a way that we can look at it and understand it? So I'm going to take you through some of these things. So one of them, uh, oh sorry, before I go on, there's a mathematical relationship between directivity index and Q, which this should look familiar now to you, uh, although I think you've kind of guessed the relationship now just from us talking through it a little bit. But directivity index is 10 times the log of Q, and Q equals the 10 to the, direct the power of directivity index divided by 10. Right? Just. And if you were paying attention a little bit, you might have discovered that relationship on your own after a little bit, once we talked about it for a few minutes. OK? Um, Uh, it's another weird font. I don't know how I end up with these. Oh, I just thought it was like some sort of math. No, it's just. OK. So let's take a look at our first way of documenting what happens to the sound when you confine it. So this is called a polar plot. Uh, so one of the things that happens when you confine the sound is that the, the loudness that you get out of it changes depending on where you stand or where you measure on an angular relationship to the thing that's making the sound. So uh, it sound, you can't, it's, not like, it's not like a light <laughs> that you can shut her off right, and get the sound to only go there and then it's not anywhere else. Right? Uh, when we confine it, it's, it's a very sloppy confinement. So what the, this is one way of looking at kind of the difference in level that you're going to get at, a, at different angles. The idea here is that you are, uh, let's assume this is a horizontal polar plot. That means you are staring down at the loudspeaker from above, and it's sort of doing this, pointing in this direction. Okay. So this zero degrees is you standing right in front of it. Okay. But if you walk or move 30 degrees over to, if you're staring at it, 30 degrees over to the left, right, then it gets a little quieter. So this, the thick, dark line represents the loudness level. And then on this little grid, each of these you know, grid lines represents a certain db, db difference. Sometimes that's 3 dB per line. Sometimes it's 5 dB. Sometimes it's 6 dB. It just depends on who made the graph and what they decided they wanted it to be. And usually they will tell you. In this case, I cropped this off of something, and it probably had the thing somewhere else. But uh, I think this is probably 6 dB per division. Uh, so well, let me just clear that out. OK, which means that when you go 60 degrees over to the left, that's where the, the two lines intersect. Okay, So comparatively speaking, at 0 degrees, the sound was hitting at this line. right? But now you go 60 degrees, and it's one line further in, which means at 60 degrees, it got 6 dB quieter. Because, you see? how this little difference here, that's a 6 dB difference. So this is telling me that 
the, the sound got 6 dB quieter when I went 60 degrees in that direction. Look what happened when I went 90 degrees. I hopped two lines. So now I'm 12 dB quieter. If I go 150 degrees, 18 dB, right? See how that works? Um, so this is, this is a result of the size of the driver and the, the size of the box and it sometimes creates those little, it's, we call them lobes. Um, so Can you please call them nubs? <laughs> I can't do lobes. You can't change the entire thing, Laura. <laughs> That's what they're called. All right. So here's, here's the problem with polar plots. Well, the good thing about polar plots, relatively simple to read, right? Hopefully you've all wrapped your head around this. This is not super complicated. The downside to them is you, is you only get to look at one frequency at a time. So this is the directivity for a particular frequency, right? Another frequency would be different. What if you so yes, you can do that. And some people will do that to try to make this just not a ridiculous amount of graphs you have to look at, is you could, you could stack them a little bit. But you get too many stacked, and it becomes impossible to read, OK? So there's a tricky balance there. The other problem is you're, you can only look, you're only seeing one axis. This is just the perfect horizontal axis. Uh, if you want to really get a complete picture of what's happening here, you need a lot of these, right? Because in most cases, they would give you a horizontal and a vertical plot. The vertical plot would be like you're looking at the last speaker from the side and zero degrees going that way. And now you're going either up or down off axis, right? But of course, sound doesn't just go up and down and left and right. It goes you know, diagonally. And so to get a full, complete picture of this, you would need to slice it on all different angles and axes and get these graphs. Uh, back when, you know, before we could really publish this stuff in a digital file, like an ease file or something, you know, if you asked for the directivity data, the polar plot data from a manufacturer, I mean, you would get a book, <laughs> you know, of many, many, many pages with many, many, many polar plots uh, that would show you horizontal and vertical for as many frequencies as they decided to graph for you. Okay, so this is a simple graph that tells you some useful information, but it's not a very efficient way of graphing it. Okay. Well, it depends. You know, there's, you know. So here's another way of looking at it. This is another way. This is called a beam width plot. And the idea behind a beam width plot is when you're thinking about the directivity of the sound, you're mostly interested in what we call the 6 dB down point. And the 6 dB down point is at what angle does it get 6 dB quieter? Because after it goes 6 dB quieter, generally it's too quiet for you, for it to be useful to you anymore. Okay? Uh, we know, because I've told you before, that your average human being that has not done any ear training or anything, 3 dB is kind of the smallest amount of change, of loudness change you could make that your average person would sort of notice. Right? You can make a 1 or a 2 dB change, and most people would not really think it got any louder or quieter. You know, Maybe if they really paid attention and you told them, hey, I'm about to turn it down, maybe they'd notice. But if you didn't tell them anything and you just tweaked it a couple of dB, they wouldn't notice. You've got to go 3 dB usually for most people to know that you did anything. Uh, so 3 dB is sort of like the barely did anything threshold. Uh, and therefore, 6 dB is sort of the, OK, everybody definitely heard that. Right? <laughs> it's now quieter. You know, so even your average person would think that if this seat sounds like this and these, this seat over here is 6 dB quieter, you know, the person sitting over here would, you know, would notice that. Right? So you tend to want to keep your sound within 6 dB. So I always say it's like give or take 3 dB right? at any from seat to seat, place to place where you listen, OK? So the idea here is once it gets 6 dB quieter, that's sort of where it's not as useful anymore. But the, uh, there's another special thing about the 6 dB down point, which is that if that is, if when it hits that 6 dB down point, 
you still have places where you're trying to send the sound. Beyond that, that's where you could introduce a second loudspeaker. And if you could get that at a, at in a kind of a mirror image distance and get its 60 dB down point to line up in that same spot, and if you could perfectly time and phase align them, that, that 60 dB dip will become zero again. You get a perfect reinforcement back up. So now you've got, you know, you've, You've got no difference between you could sit in the center right on axis with this loudspeaker and you can move all the way over to the center of the other one and it, all of that area between there would be the same level. Okay? That's the other important thing about 6 dB down point. So a beam width plot is trying to show you the 6 dB down points for this given loudspeaker per frequency and per vertical and horizontal axis. So the squares are the horizontal 6 dB down points and the triangles are the vertical 6 dB down points. So for example, let's look at 1 kilohertz here. Okay, So for this particular loudspeaker, uh, the 6 dB down point is, if that's 10, 20, oops, come back, come back. I'll use the mouse. No mouse. OK, so we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So it is at 90, 80, 70, 60. So this is a 60 degree vertical loudspeaker at 1 kilohertz. So at 1 kilohertz, this thing does 60 degrees vertically before you get 60 be quieter. OK, so that's 30 degrees on either side. OK? And that goes out like a cone? Yeah. Like an alligator jaw? Yeah. More than 6 dB quieter, probably. Interesting. So at that 30 degrees, it is 6 dB quieter, right? So, so during like the of the situation, yeah. less or more than? Yeah, probably. But that's the weakness of this graph is it doesn't tell you that information. What is happening? In it, the just, it just tells you when it got 6 dB quieter. It doesn't tell you, know, you go past that angle, right. you have no idea. But you can assume it's more than 6 dB quieter, right? How much more? I don't know. OK, same frequency, 1 kilohertz. The square, it looks like it's hovering around 85 degrees. So this is, this is probably an 85 to 90 degree horizontal coverage and a 60 degree vertical coverage at 1 kilohertz. OK? That's a good That's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty typical. But that's only at 1 kilohertz. Let's now, let's look over here at, what's this frequency? Two, three, four, five, six kilohertz here. It is a, let's see, 90, 80, 70, 60. It's 60 by 60 at five kilohertz or six kilohertz. So at one kilohertz, it's wider horizontal than it is vertical, but at five or six kilohertz, it's the same, 60 by 60. Okay. Now, what if you get down to 100 hertz? It's 360 degrees on both axes. This is effectively omnidirectional at 100 hertz. So 100 hertz and below goes everywhere. 1 kilohertz is around 85 horizontal to 60 vertical. But you get up to 4 to 6 kilohertz, and it's like 60 degrees conical, we would call that. Okay. So what does that tell you? Any, any, anything interesting? Anyone that, how does that information maybe impact your life? Well, the first thing that, it, that I would hope that you realize is that you read, when you read a spec sheet for a loudspeaker and it says, oh, this is a 90 degree horizontal by 40 degree vertical. That is a gross oversimplification. And it's actually a lie. <laughs> so then how do they come up with that? Do they just decide? <laughs> they just pick one? <laughs> like it's, 90 it's almost completely made up. You know? I mean, there, there is a frequency where that is true. And maybe it's kind of a general average of 
but they, they, they tend to look at the high frequencies, right? Those tend to be the ones that you can be directional for. So they, they don't, they kind of ignore the low ones. So. Yeah. So generally speaking, uh, one kilohertz and below is not going to be part of that 90 by 40, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so when they say 90 by 40, they're usually talking about somewhere between the, that range of one kilohertz to four kilohertz. It t will be kind of in that general directivity area, but it's, as you can see, it, it, it's not consistent. So that's the first thing to understand is that it's not consistent, right? And, and just calling that a 90 degree horizontal loudspeaker is way, way oversimplification. Um, it's far more complicated than that. Um, so that's the first thing that maybe I hope you're thinking about right now. The second thing that I hope that maybe you're thinking about right now is that where do you put the person? If you want the person to hear all the frequencies at the same level, where do you put them? If this is the last speaker you're using. It's kind of hard to tell, right? Yeah. I mean, if you can't get them right in front of it, you know, if, if it's not pointed straight at the person listening to it, there's no way they're hearing all the frequencies at the same level. Because you move a little bit over to the left, a little bit over to the right, a little bit up, a little bit down, the frequency response is changing a lot, okay? What do you do about that? Um, yeah, I mean, EQ cannot solve that problem. Why would an EQ not solve that problem? Because then you're just making everything Yeah. Well, the EQ can only solve a problem that everybody hears. It can't solve a problem that only one person hears. So you add more speakers? What's that? Can you solve that problem? Headphones. Stop. This is not still life with rockets. So you can... That, that question, Grayson, is that is the holy grail. So the answer is no. That is what every loudspeaker manufacturer in the world is trying to answer that question is, yeah. hmm, can I make that not happen? Can I make it so when I go off axis, the frequency response doesn't change? Exactly. It's a big reason why some loudspeakers are a lot more expensive than other ones is because the closer somebody can get to, to solving that problem, the more money they can charge for the loudspeaker. So think about that one that Chris showed us right at the end of the day at DMB, that big liner element where he was like, turn it over and, and, the, and, and everything got quieter all the way down to like, what was it, 200 hertz or something? And it was like, whoa, and I was freaking out. Um, that's why. Because it's like, holy cow. Like, they're getting really close. Like they haven't solved it yet completely, but they're getting very close. <laughs> As someone who's been in sound and looking at this for years and years, that we are going to, like, do you think this is like an absolute zero situation where we're just going to approach it forever and never actually hit it? Yeah. Um, be, be, well, it, and the reason is, is it's, it's not that it's impossible. It's that accomplishing it requires compromises that we're unwilling to make. Right. Okay. Right. So it's always, it's, it's a tricky balance of like, okay, how close can we get to solving this while still f staying a sufficient distance away from the problems that we don't want? Because right. there's other problems that we don't want either, right? And, and that's the thing with sound. There's no problem you can solve in sound that doesn't introduce a new problem. Do you think we're kind of coming up on something new? Not really, <laughs> because like, I'm, I'm not seeing anything on the horizon that is gonna dramatically change this scenario. Um, there's a lot of, of little trickery going on yeah. that you'll see with the, where they're trying to kind of get closer, but there's no new technology on the horizon that, that is going to fix this that I can see coming anyway. We need the Elon Musk sound. Oh okay. Oh no. Here, here's another graph. This is called a directivity plot. <laughs> this I don't find super helpful, um, but you would maybe use this. Uh, it used to be like long time ago. Um, I mean, you all take for granted that you can just go buy a loudspeaker and it has a couple of drivers in it with a horn and a box and it's just a thing, right? And you just put a cable into it and sound comes out and sounds pretty good, right? That is a relatively new development 
in the world of sound. Um, it, it was not that long ago, like within our lifetimes. You were little children, babies, and I was, you know, your age, uh, when that was not a thing. Uh, that you actually bought individual drivers in boxes and you stacked them. There's a reason they call them stacks. Where are you putting your stacks? Because it's a term that come from the day that when, you could, when you couldn't buy a single box that would give you all the frequencies. Right? You, would, you had to buy individual drivers inside boxes and stack them in order to get it to happen, to get what you needed. Um, and when you did that, you had to care about what each individual box and driver was doing and what its directivity was for the frequencies it was dealing with. So something like this was really helpful. So if I was going to buy this horn, I would say, I'm going to use this horn for the driver that is going to be producing 2 kilohertz to 8 kilohertz. Why? because its directivity index is really, really consistent in that range of frequencies. But not below one. But not the other ones. I would not use this for my subwoofer. So then you would hook up these and do crossovers. Yeah, exactly. So I would say, OK, this horn is pretty consistent from 1,500 hertz up to, well, almost 10, right? So I'm going to use that on that driver, right, to try to get my directivity. And I'm going to have to find something else for 1500 hertz and below, right? That's where this kind of thing is helpful. But it's just showing you on the horizontal axis is frequency, on the vertical axis is directivity index and Q. So directivity index is over here on the left, Q is over here on the right. Um, just another way of looking at it. It doesn't really, it, there's, not, there's no angles involved here. It doesn't tell you any of that. It just kind of gives you a sense of you know, how the confinement is per frequency. And you're looking for you know, a, perfect, a perfect one. The unobtainium holy grail horn would be a straight, a flat horizontal line all the way across. Um, that horn doesn't exist, but that would be super cool if it did. Uh, so, but, but seriously, like the difference, like we've got in our shop, we've got some DMB Q series stuff. And the Q, we've got Q10, Q7, and Q1. The Q1 is, we paid $3,000 for that one, and we only paid $2,000 for the Q7. You know what the difference between the two is? The horn. It's the only difference. Is there is $1,000 worth of more work and cleverness in that horn on the Q1. OK? This is another way of looking at it. This is called an isobars. Uh, this is an attempt to kind of uh, combine the three graphs I've already shown you, <laughs> right? Um, so this lets you see the kind of thing that the directivity plot was trying to show you. Um, and also kind of the similar sort of thing that the, that the polar plot was trying to show you. Uh, so you can get a sense of how consistent it is per frequency, um, but you also get the angular relationships here. So, you know, this, this line here, this is the on axis. Now, th this is still only for one, ac you know, this would be like the horizontal isobar. Uh, but if you are right at it, you would get, um, you know, all the sound equally, right? What's happening here is when you hit this line, this is your 6 dB down range. So this gray, this light gray area is the 6 dB down area. Yeah. Why does, um, yeah. what? Uh, at like 500 on both sides of the graph, why is there that point where the gray is like hard? Yeah, so that, that's because this is, this, this is that DMBQ series I was telling you about. So the two low frequency drivers actually produce the same sound. And on that axis across them, they interact in a way that it, it, it narrows the coverage, which is pretty clever. Um, so what you're looking at here is you're saying, OK, well, at 4 kilohertz, I'm 6 dB down. At 
20 degrees over to the right and 20 degrees over to the left. But at 250 hertz, I hit 6 dB down at 70 degrees to either side. Okay? So on and so forth. Um, this is kind of cool because uh, you do get some ang angle information off of this per frequency, which is nice. But you also get to kind of see the consistency, right? Where is it consistent? So it's pretty consistent here, right, between 4K and 10K. And then it starts getting a little wonky. But if I were to sort of average this out, you know, I would probably say around here is the average rate. And guess what? They've spec'd this thing as a 75 degree horizontal or 70 degree horizontal loudspeaker, okay? Which is 35 to either side, okay? So that's an isobar. Okay. This one, this is another way of, of looking at it, which is that it's called the family of off axis frequency response curves. Um, the idea here is that. Uh, it, and I really like this, this kind of graph, by the way, because uh, I think that we put a little too much emphasis on this notion of 6 dB down point and all that kind of stuff, because it, gets you the, it gives you the impression that the loudspeaker gets quieter when you go off axis. And, and that's not, that is a way, way oversimplification. It's not that the loudspeaker gets quieter, it's that some frequencies get quieter and some don't, right? And so what really happens is as you go off axis, the frequency response changes. And that's what I prefer to think about. I, I, I'm not as interested in it getting quieter as much as I am the frequency response changes. Because to be perfectly honest with you, even in that scenario where this person is sitting here and this person over here is hearing something 6 dB quieter, the person over here that's hearing 6 dB quieter, they don't know that the person over there is hearing 6 dB more sound. Right? They don't ever move. So the, all they're hearing is the show they're hearing. Um, and if, if their show is 6 dB quieter than somebody else, they don't necessarily know that. What I'm interested in is, in what, is what they're hearing, even though it's maybe something like 6 dB quieter, does it still sound good? Because if it still sounds good and they can still hear everything, That's okay. then it's fine. And the fact that it's 6 dB quieter doesn't matter because they don't know that, it, that they could have gotten 6 dB more by getting a different seat. Um, they'll never know that. As long as all they know is I sat there and it sounded good. Okay. So I'm far more interested in at how far off axis can I go from this loudspeaker before the frequency response changes more than I'm willing to accept. Okay. And that's what you're seeing here is the solid line is the, the frequency response of this loudspeaker when you're sitting right in front of it on axis. And this little dashed line the uh, is when you go 10 degrees, how does it change? The, the larger dashed line is 20 degrees and the dotted line is 30 degrees. So what we're saying is that, you know, when you go 30 degrees off axis of this thing, it stays pretty consistent until you get to two kilohertz. And then at two kilohertz, this frequency response is changing a lot. That's the frequency response, the red line as compared to the black line. Right? So yeah, it got overall quieter, but the frequency response changed. The, re the relationship and loudness between the frequencies changed. You see that? Quite a lot. Yeah, quite a lot. I would not want to put a person at that 30 degree spot because I think that that frequency response has changed more than I'm comfortable with. I would probably be okay with putting somebody there. Right? But I would not be okay with putting somebody in that 30 degree spot because they would hear a very different sort of thing. So Jason, is there a slight increase up there around like 10K? It looks like it, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, so I think this is pretty cool, actually, because I, I, this to me is the real point about directivity is not just that it gets quieter, it's that the frequency response changes. And at what point? has the frequency response changed more than I'm okay with? Right? That's the question I'm interested in. So I find this helpful. Okay, what are we talking about next? Ah, okay, so now we're getting to Nora's question. 
which is which is like well what, what maybe if the if the frequency response changes so much when we start confining the sound then maybe this whole confining the sound thing isn't such a good idea why don't we just make a more sensitive loudspeaker driver and make it louder that way um, and then we don't have to worry about the directivity and the frequency response why not, Jason? Well, the, because the way that we are able to make a, a device that, because you know, a loudspeaker is, is called a transducer. Mm -hmm. It converts one form of energy into another form of energy. What's what are the two forms of energy? Were uh, yeah. So it it takes an electrical signal and converts that into a sound pressure wave. Okay. Uh, and the way that we have to build that in order to do that, I mean, in order to create that sound pressure wave, we have to actually have a larger, large enough kind of area that we can actually push on a significant amount of sound, of air, right? Um, and in order to do that, it creates this new problem. <laughs> and this new problem is that that driver, that circular piece of paper that we attach to the magnet that pushes and pulls on the air, uh, it has an inherent directivity to it. The yeah. yeah. Uh, and that directivity depends on how large it is. So, uh, if the size of that little piece of paper that we're sticking to the magnet if the diameter of that is smaller by a lot than the, the frequency it's trying to produce, then it will be omnidirectional for that frequency, right? It could spray that one everywhere. But if that is, if that driver that is significantly larger than the frequency it's trying to reproduce, it will be very directional for that one, okay? So take a look at what's going on here. It can, yeah, it can do it. But what do you run into this issue of like, you know, larger wavelength, more force needed, you know, kind of a little Think about that for just a little bit longer. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> what is the smallest loudspeaker you've ever heard? Like a headphone. Do you hear all the frequencies the same out of that headphone? I mean, like, you don't get any bass, really, out of, like, It depends on the headphones, ears, but, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, just I mean, I'm talking like dramatically different. Like, oh yeah. Put in, put put a little, even the cheap earbud that yeah. comes with your iPhone. Stick that in your ear. Pretty wide frequency response. You're getting all the frequencies. Yeah. Yeah, they're just not some are wider right? than others. Yeah. But I would argue that that difference, like that difference in bass, has more to do with your hearing than the driver itself, right? Yeah. Uh, that the real thing is that you need more amplitude at the low frequencies for your ears to perceive it as the same loudness, right? We learned that a couple weeks ago, right? So that driver is producing all of those frequencies at the same level. It's just you don't hear them at the same level because of your you know, stupid you know, ears that aren't equally sensitive, right? Uh, so yeah, it's not that. Even the smallest of drivers can produce all the frequencies. Um, so it's not about fidelity. Any driver can produce all the frequencies. Um, it's really about directivity. <laughs> Uh, and it's about frequency response off-axis. With the earbud, there is no off-axis. You're pointing the thing straight down your ear canal, okay? There is no 10 degrees off-axis, okay? Uh, so here's the scenario we're looking at. It's the scenario here, this is like a, a, a half polar plot, okay? okay? So if the diameter of the loudspeaker driver is equal to the wavelength, of the frequency it's producing. This is what happens. It actually gets kind of pretty directional. So zero, you know, straight on axis, you've got, you know, whatever you have. Now you go to, to this angle, you are 5 dB quieter. To this angle, you're 10 dB quieter, right? For that frequency where the wavelength is equal to the diameter of the driver. However, over here, where the diameter of the driver is a fourth of the wavelength, this would be for like a low frequency, it's basically omnidirectional. Okay? 
So then, it's a stupid question, but like, why aren't we making all the drivers so big or so small? Like, so what you're saying here, it sounds like it's very achievable to make like very, very, very omnidirectional. Well, well, so look at this though. So what if the diameter of the driver is six times larger than the frequency? It creates a laser beam. OK? It literally emits a laser beam. Don't ask that. Um, this, this is all, all six of these graphs are the same driver. What? Oh, at different frequencies. Yeah. This, this, all six of these graphs are the exact same driver. We're just changing what frequency we put out of it. And depending on what frequency we put out of it, the directivity of it changes dramatically. So now think back to the thing that I said was actually really important uh, about directivity. I said it like five minutes ago. What is the thing that we really care about? It's not so much that it gets quieter. It's that it's an accurate representation the, frequency. the frequency response, right? So the frequency response changes. So if I want the frequency response to stay consistent as I go off axis, I cannot do that with one driver. I cannot do it. Exactly. This is why we put more than one driver inside of boxes, OK? Because you cannot achieve that goal. It is not possible to achieve that goal of having the frequency response stay consistent when you go off axis if you only have one driver is simply not possible. At least, no one has figured it out yet. <laughs> OK? Uh, there might be some radical new approach that no one sees coming that might be able to solve this. But at the moment, with what we understand now and the technology we have, it is not possible to do it with one driver. That one driver can produce all the frequencies, and it can produce them equally for one direction. That's the one thing you notice, is that for all these graphs, there's one angle where all frequencies are the same loudness. What is that angle? Straight on. Zero, zero, right? Zero degrees is the only angle where all the frequencies are the same loudness, which is fine for the earbud that you stick in your ear and shoot down your ear canal, right? But if you're trying to shoot through the air a certain distance and you want a certain amount of people to all hear the same thing, not possible with one driver. Can't do it, OK? So we need multiple drivers. So. Now, everybody remember what this looks like? Yes. Because let me show you what it looks like when you just add a second driver. So just two. Yep. So now we're going to put two drivers in there. Are they the same size? No. Wow. One is significantly smaller than the other. OK? This is what happens. OK? So we still are pretty. Um, So th this, this is actually something where you've got two drivers loaded conically, uh, or uh, coaxially. Okay, so you've got a big one, and then right in front of it is a little one. So I'm, with this diameter, I'm talking about the diameter of the largest one. But there's a smaller one right in front of it, okay? So we're still pretty wide at the low frequencies, right? That, that you know, diameter is a quarter of the wavelength. We're starting to get a little bit more directional than we were before, but not by much, okay? So this part doesn't change so much. This is basically the same as we had before. But look what happens for the, the, the 2x diameter, the 4x, and the 6x diameter. We're not getting the laser beam anymore. Right? So those high frequencies that used to zoom, be a laser, are now have widened out. Why? Because we put those out of a smaller driver. And it's not that the smaller driver produces those high frequencies better. It's that the smaller driver is smaller than those frequencies. <laughs> and therefore, cannot be as directional over them. Right? That's why we use the small drivers for the high frequencies. It's not because small drivers make high frequencies sound better. It's that small drivers can't control high frequencies. What's the interesting thing about that? Well, more broad, so well, the coaxial doesn't matter. I mean, you get you can get the same thing with this, right? You get the same the same effect. This is just happens to be. I was trying to sort of the reason I mentioned the coaxial thing is I'm referring to diameter here, and it's like 
Oh no, there is a difference, but <laughs> I'm saying, but for purposes of, of general directivity, no. So uh, one of the things that we do is we can we can use a horn uh, that we can put onto a small driver, and that horn can overcome some of the remaining directivity issues. With, you know, and disperse even that a little bit more evenly. So that's what the horn coupled with a smaller driver, and you can get really even response in that one to four k range. Okay. Well, then you can get get it like from five hundred hertz to two kilohertz or something, right? It's just depends, right? But uh, the other thing you can do is if you didn't want to put a horn in it, you could just have something that had lots of drivers, right? So if you just you, know, you can make one that has six drivers, and each driver is half the diameter of the one before it, right? If you're just like cutting the diameter half and half and half and half, and you can stack as many as you want, and you then just divide the frequency spectrum in octave bands, so that right, so that each driver is only handling an octave range of frequency, then you can get something that disperses all the frequencies pretty evenly, not perfectly evenly, but pretty evenly, right? Which is kind of what happens with a lot of like home theater stuff that is where you're not having to shoot a really far distance, like you're just shooting across the living room, and you don't need it to be super loud. But it's fine. I mean, that's a totally valid strategy. And that's a totally valid strategy if you don't have to shoot a very far distance. Why Why is distance the problem there? Because you have six. Yeah, it's fine. Like, that's it's totally a valid approach. The problem is you give up loudness to do that. Right? You give up loudness to do that. And... If you're only shooting across the living room, no big whoop, right? You're trying to shoot across a few hundred yards of a stadium or something, you're going to need something more, right? You're going to need a better strategy, right? You're just not going to end up with enough sound at the other end, okay? Um, so, the, the real take-home message that I want you to wrap your head around is two things. One is that, I don't care what the last speaker is, how clever it is, or how much money you spent on it, or which crazy German engineer like did some stuff to the inside of it, doesn't really matter. But unless you are staring straight down the throat of that thing, you are not getting the same frequency response. Right? You are not. If you move five degrees to the right, you are not getting the same frequency response. That's the first thing you need to know. The frequency response changes for any aspect. I don't care what it is. Frequency response changes as you move off axis. It just will. The only question is, by how much? And is that too much? Okay, that's, that's the question you have to answer. So that's first take-home message. Frequency response changes when you go off axis. Yes. Second take-home message is this notion of size. Yes. So you don't even have to look at the spec sheet of loudspeaker to figure out generally how what frequencies is going to be directional over. Look at this one that's right up above my head. That's the lowest frequency that that thing's going to be directional over. We don't even have to look it up. We can figure it out just by staring at it. How big do you think that low driver is? It looks like it's about an 8-inch driver. So what frequency has a wavelength of 8 inches? Come on, I'll tell you how to do this. What frequency has a wavelength of 8 inches? Convert 8 inches to feet first. 8 divided by 12 gives you what? 2 thirds. 2 So what is that in decimal? What? What? Four eight thirds? Four eight. 
but we're still on this. What is 1,000 divided by 0.75? Point six, 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 is not eight divided by 12, it's two thirds. Thank you. Alright. Wow, that was a good yeah, one. Yeah, it would be well over 10 feet. I had it right now. That was bad. Alright. I started. I taught you how to do this less than a month ago. Eight divided by 12. Okay. Yeah, really wasn't cool. an hour ago. <laughs> That's all one thousand one hundred thirty feet per second divided by that number, which is a wavelength, right? Yes. Oops, sorry. Hang on. Oh, I lost my number. Eight. Eight divided by twelve equals plus one thousand one hundred thirty feet per second divided by that number, and I get one thousand six hundred ninety-five hertz. There is no way that that loudspeaker is going to be directional for anything below 1,700 hertz. Seriously? That's high. It is omnidirectional for every frequency below 1,700 hertz, guaranteed. Doesn't matter what the crossover is, doesn't matter how they programmed it, what's going on with that horn, none of that matters. It will not be directional below 1,700 hertz. Not going to happen. Physics does not allow it. Okay. That is the take home. So <clears throat> you could look through the shop and you don't have to look at the specs. And if you know that you need to control, you need to keep 500 hertz off the stage, for example. Right? You want to be able to control 500 hertz out of your center cluster, you're going to hang over the top. How large does that center cluster have to be on, on some axis? How 500 hertz? Yes. Uh, 500 hertz has a wavelength of what? Thousand divided by 500. Two. Oh, two. two feet. <laughs> Some part of that loudspeaker needs to be two feet. Wait, which part? Any of them? Well, <laughs> the part that is vertical. <laughs> sure. Okay. Has to be at least two feet tall, or two feet wide, or two feet deep. It's gonna be, well, the two feet on the axis you're trying to control 500 hertz, right? Okay. At least, or there's no chance, right? So, of course, there are other variables involved here, but I'm just saying you're generally going to like wander through the shop and you're looking for something that can control 500 hertz. Anything that's smaller than two feet on its largest side is not going to do it. It's just not. Okay? So those are, the, those are the things I want you to understand. Frequency response changes when you go off axis. Things get quieter. Yes, they get quieter, but really frequency response changes. So, and size of the loudspeaker dictates what frequencies it's able to control. Um, so maybe one could ask, well, gee, then why don't we just make everything out of enormous loudspeaker drivers? Oh, it's me. I'm who asked that. Right? Well, you asked the opposite. Why don't Why don't we just make everything small, right? And yeah, but now I'm asking why we don't make it large. Right. So why don't we just make everything large? Why not? Right. Why don't we? Well, heavy. sure. But the other reason is, if everything was enormous, then the high frequencies would be a laser beam. But how fun would that be? <laughs> Well, that would get you closer, yeah. Thesis but <laughs> Boom. He Lance, take it. <laughs> that would get you closer. Lance, we're just keep okay. The but <laughs> without, I, I, we don't have time to really dive into this. But the whole, the the concept of a line array is an attempt to make something a really, really large driver 
that doesn't laser beam the high frequencies? That's, how we get into line That's what line arrays do, is that you're able to create this huge stack that acts like one huge driver that can now control a really low frequency on that axis, but you still are able to disperse the high frequencies evenly on that same axis. So there's a lot of trickery involved there, but which we don't have time to get into. But that is, uh, but they haven't actually changed any of these rules in doing that, right? Like all of these rules I've just taught you still apply to a line array. It's just that we're we're way. using these rules to our advantage in a slightly different way to accomplish that. But there's a trade-off to all that, and it comes in the form of the amount you have to pay for it, yeah. the the weight that you have to deal with, and um, you know, and also the sort of complexity of the system. It's you have to buy a lot. You have to. There's a lot of. So a lot of parts involved in making that work, right? It's a lot more complicated of a setup than this little thing over here, right? Okay, so there's crash course, crash course in directivity. And then we're doing more directivity on Friday? Yeah, so what we're going to do on Friday is I'm going to take you through, you know, how do you take this information? You could find out this information about whatever loudspeaker cabinet that you're going to get, right? And you could, how do you use the published information about its directivity to figure out where the sound is going to go oh, to all the seats, that's right? That's what we're going to do Friday, is how do I know if this is going to cover all the seats with a sufficient frequency response? That's what we're going to do Friday. Nice. We're going to learn how to do it. Project. We're going to do it by hand, not by ease, right? So you're going to actually figure this out on your own with just AutoCAD and polar plots, OK? Because so, again, I'm a firm believer in never asking a computer to do something for you that you don't already know how to do for yourself. And therefore, before I teach you how to let the computer figure that out for you using ease, I'm going to make sure that you know how to do it yourself.